And again, welcome to our webinar. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about our speaker today. His name is Mike Perkins. And Mike is the president of Frontline HR Solutions and Perkins ADR, both based out of Gadsden, Alabama. Mike has an extensive background, and I think you're going to learn a lot uh, during the next hour. Uh, in addition to serving as a mediator, Mike provides guidance to employers and employees regarding HR compliance, conflict resolution, and crisis management. He's also an AV rated attorney in Florida, a senior certified professional in human resources, a John Maxwell certified coach. He's a registered mediator here with the Alabama Center for Dispute Resolution, as well as an EEO certified investigator. And in today's webinar, you're going to learn about ADR and its application for businesses. And as lawyers and mediators, you can learn how to use ADR for employers as well as the businesses in a variety of different situations. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker today, Mike Perkins. Well, thanks, Eileen, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be kicking off a, a really fine week of programming that the Alabama Center for Dispute Resolution has planned for, uh, for those that are interested in learning more about ADR. And uh, this, this program it is, a, is a pretty general program, and it is intended primarily for laymen who don't normally become involved in mediation and arbitrations, but may have had some experience with our justice system. Um, at the same time, I understand there are a lot of attorneys and mediators and people who have a lot of experience with ADR. And, and you know, I, I hope that you'll find this helpful in maybe being able to educate your clients and others about uh, the pros and cons of different forms of alternative dispute resolution. Certainly you can use this uh, presentation if you feel it would be helpful to explain alternative dispute resolution to your clients uh, as situations arise. So let's jump right into it. We uh, have a, an hour and we'll, uh, as, we, as Eileen said, we'll take time for question and answers as they come up and uh, at the end also I've reserved a little time. So um, the, Everyone agrees, I think, that the legal assist, legal assist, le, uh, the American legal system is, is a great system, but has its uh, limitations, and there are certainly criticisms, and we've seen a lot of those and heard a lot of those recently. The uh, question is, is it highly efficient? Um, in some systems, it might be, and some court systems are more efficient than others. Is it fair? That's something that you're uh, it's certainly hearing a lot about these days. We all know it's expensive. Uh, to go through the court system. And so um, that's why alternative dispute resolution uh, popped up many years ago and has become more and more popular over time. I wanna tell you about a case that I was involved with. It was really the last jury trial I tried uh, because I haven't, I've been more involved on the HR side than in the legal practice side for several years. But this case was uh, a case where two engineers for a technology company that was actually involved in making missiles and missile guidance systems for the, for the military, uh, laid off two senior engineers in 1992, in November of 1992. They had a reduction of force. They had a change in technology that the Air Force uh, had asked this company to adopt, moving from uh, more laser and radar oriented guidance systems to GPS systems. And a lot of that was a result of the Gulf War, as you recall, when there was a lot of smoke in the, in the, in the uh, oil fields and some of the guidance systems were thrown off by that and there was a move towards uh, this new thing uh, back then that the military was well aware of but us laymen didn't know we would be so enslaved to called GPS. And so they riffed uh, two uh, senior engineers who were more, I guess, versed in laser and radar and, and they reduced them and, and hired some younger engineers who were more versed in GPS. So that was in November 92. In December of 94, they filed an age discrimination. Two of these gentlemen filed an age discrimination case in the Northern District of Florida. Two years later, the case went to trial. In the meantime, uh, in those two years, there, were, there, were, there was extensive discovery that took place all over the country, lots of depositions, uh, document exchanges, a lot of hearings on issues. And finally, in November of 1996, four years after the terminations had occurred, the case went to jury trial. 
The jury trial lasted a week. At the end, the judge entered a judgment as a matter of law in favor of Swerdrup technology. Afterwards, the case was appealed to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And a year after that, or a year and a half after that, uh, almost two years after that, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the trial court upholding the decision. So uh, six years, almost six years after the termination occurred, the case was finally resolved and Swerdrup Technology was the so-called winner because they prevailed in the case. I can assure you that the legal fees and the expenses they, were, they incurred in the process they didn't feel like a winner uh, because uh, there were several hundred thousand dollars of expenses involved in this case. And again, even though they won, there's a real question of whether they really won. So we all, or most of us are familiar with the legal system, but again, for this is uh, aimed at, at businesses and, and a lot of people that might not be as familiar. We know that there are state and federal courts, there are criminal and civil courts. We know that there can be trial by jury and there can be trial by judge. And then that the cases and the trials and the rulings in the legal system are all public and often very public, particularly when you have high profile cases. Then we have the trial courts that are both state and federal and we have appellate courts, both at the state and federal level. And then of course we have our uh, top uh, appellate courts, which are the state and federal su Supreme Courts. The typical civil case that goes to trial is extremely expensive. And this is a chart uh, prepared from some court data that shows the typical cost of defending or, or trying a case um, of different types. And so everything from an automobile accident case, which uh, somewhere predicted around $43,000 to go through trial through employment and contract litigation cases, and, uh, and malpractice cases, which are extremely expensive because they are very uh, intent, fact intense, a lot of experts involved. Most of the expense there is in the actual trial, but the second level of expense is in discovery, which we know can, can drag on, as in the Swerdrup case, for years and, and cost tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees, expert fees, travel costs, uh, and those types of expenses. So there's no question that trying cases, taking a case through trial is extremely expensive. And here's a list of some of the expenses that are associated with taking a case uh, into uh, through regular civil litigation. We all know that, I mean, these are pretty standard types of, of expenses, but uh, one of the greatest expenses, which is very hard to quantify, is the lost productivity. At the bottom, I, I refer to for witnesses and company representatives who were tied up in litigation. I know in that sort of case, there were a lot of senior level company engineers and executives who were tied up for a lot of their time, very valuable time uh, in, in meetings and discovery and, and, and for sitting through trial. So it, it's very hard to quantify that, but it's an extremely high expense when you have your top officials of a company involved in the litigation. And it's also very distracting for them and makes it very hard for them to focus even when they are at work, when they are thinking about the issues and some of the frustrations that they experience and, and certainly the, uh, the risk involved in going through litigation. We also know that going through the court system is extremely, uh, it, it's slow, it, it you know, particularly at the pace that many businesses operate, uh, it seems extremely slow and frustrating for business, businesses and organizations or any litigants that are going through the trial process. So the typical time for a case to go through disposition, whether it's a trial or otherwise, is between six and 24 months. And, uh, and that's, I think that most people would say that's pretty consistent, uh, you know, it, it will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, court system to court system. An appeal uh, after the case is disposed of at the trial level, often appeals are filed and appeals can, can take anywhere from six months to three years to be resolved. And the average cost for an appeal is somewhere between $25,000 and $100,000 or, or more for obviously if you're going up through the Supreme Court and, and, and several layers of appeal. So 
there's no question that the the process is both expensive and a, a time consumer. So then we look at well, what are the alternatives to litigation? And and there are many. Uh, and and there are some that are more popular and more highly used than others. Uh, negotiation is where the participants just seem seek to try to work out the problems themselves. And you know, if if it were that easy, then we wouldn't need the civil court system. Everyone would work out their issues. But unfortunately, not many people are really good at negotiation, and a lot of people aren't really willing to actively participate in negotiation and often need assistance. And that's where mediation comes in, and that's where I'm going to focus most of this discussion today is on mediation. That's where a neutral party, a neutral mediator, helps the participants, helps the parties in the lawsuit or in the pre-litigation dispute reach a mutually agreeable resolution. So it's really no one is, 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 is making a judgment or a decision other than the participants who reach a mutually agreeable resolution with the help of a third party neutral mediator. And then there's a, uh, an area of alternative dispute resolution called collaborative, where specially trained attorneys work together to reach a resolution. This is normally utilized in family law and it is uh, an active and growing area of family law uh, dispute resolution, but it, al it also can be utilized in other areas. I'm not a real expert on that, and uh, I'm, I'm, I believe that there are programs that are presented, Eileen, from time to time on collaborative yes, that Mike, might help right. people that are interested. Yes. Um, there is an active group up in the Birmingham area called the Birmingham Collaborative Alliance, and you can, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to collaborativepractice.com. But the center has partnered with the Birmingham Collaborative Alliance for the past two years to put on webinars to educate attorneys about the Collaborative um, Law Act, which um, it's actually called the Alabama Uniform Collaborative Law Act, which went into effect in 2014. And you're right, it is used for family and domestic type cases. Um, so. It is, hasn't really taken off a lot in Alabama. It seems to be more concentrated up in the northern part of the state, but there is a growing interest down um, in the lower half of the state as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then we move to arbitration, and a lot of people are familiar with that, particularly in the securities area and also in the labor area, where, and, and then a lot of insurance um, contracts also require arbitration. And arbitration is where you have a, a third party arbitrator who makes a decision instead of a judge or a jury, but there's a binding decision. Uh, there, there actually is a, a form of arbitration called non-binding arbitration, but um, most of your contracts with labor unions and, and, and your financial services contracts normally would have binding arbitration where the arbitrator makes a decision that is a binding decision that the parties have agreed to abide by. And then private judging is also a very, or the use of a private judge is also uh, growing uh, in popularity. It's where a former judge serves in basically the same capacity, uh, but it's not an active judge that is, that is serving. It's a former judge or a retired judge normally uh, serving as a private judge outside the court system, but conducting uh, a trial or a proceeding in very similar manner to the court system. And uh, as I understand, there's a program Thursday, I believe, this Thursday, that the Alabama Center for Dispute Resolution is presenting on private judging. You can learn a lot more about that during that program. The final area that I'm gonna talk about is the ombudsman approach, where you have a specialist employed by a company or by the state or by uh, a, a group to, who helps, who serves as a mediator of sorts to help resolve issues before litigation is filed. And uh, I understand there's also a program, the Alabama Department of Labor has an active workers comp ombudsman program. And as I understand, Eileen, jump in again if you like, uh, there's a, a program on that later this week. That's right, Mike. There's a program tomorrow that the workers comp division of the Alabama Department of Labor is putting on to explain about their ombuds program, and it's a free program. Excellent. So again, there's some great programs this week, and if you'd like to explore those, I encourage you to check out the uh, 
Alabama for Dispute Resolution website and there are links to register for each of those programs. So uh, it, it's a good time to kind of focus on that. And I'm going to let those programs expound more on those areas. I want to talk about mediation a little bit more and, and compare it to arbitration because some people still get a little confused about that. In mediation, uh, and here's some just some comparatives. In mediation, you normally have a one mediator. It's a, normally a person who acts as a solo mediator or who, or who may work for a mediation service or group. Uh, in arbitration, you normally have anywhere from one to three arbitrators. It might be an arbitrator that's mutually agreed upon by the parties, or it might be that each of the parties selects one, and then the, together they select the, the third arbitrator. Uh, again, the arbitrators might work on their own, or they might work through a service such as the American Arbitration Association or JAMS or other services that provide arbitration uh, services. So both of these media, mediation and arbitration are either are normally you can contract for that in, in, a, in an agreement between the business and an employee or between other two businesses or between businesses and a customer. Uh, you contract for mediation or arbitration or it might, might be that the parties to a, uh, to a dispute decide to take it to mediation or arbitration on their own. The, the difference between uh, mediation and arbitration is that the court is also empowered, the courts are empowered to order mediation in many court systems and many judges routinely order that the parties attempt to go through mediation uh, early on in a, in a case that's filed in the civil court system in an effort for the parties to try to work out the resolution. I, was, I, was, I cut my teeth in law in Florida and mediation has been very, very active in Florida for many, many years. And almost all the trial courts require an attempt uh, at mediating a case before the judge will let the case move too far along in the circuit, in the civil court system. Mediation and arbitration may both be pre-suit before a lawsuit is filed, or they can be agreed to or uh, ordered post-suit after uh, litigation is filed. And in many cases in arbitration, in many agreements, it's a mandatory alternative to, to filing a suit. So uh, it, it, many agreements, the parties don't even have an opportunity to take a case to trial. They've agreed to waive the civil court system and go through the arbitration system. And, and some of them are, some of those agreements are combination mediation and arbitration agreements, where first it's submitted to mediation, and if it's not successfully mediated, then the parties agree to take it to a binding arbitration. Mediation and arbitration uh, can normally be scheduled much quicker than a trial because you're not waiting on the court system, you're waiting on a mediator and you, or an arbitrator and you often have your choice of those so you can look around for one who, whose schedule agrees with yours and, and certainly you have to coordinate it between the parties. But normally a mediation can be scheduled within a month or two, sometimes even quicker than that. I've had them scheduled within a couple of days. Um, and then same thing with, with arbitration, a little bit harder to schedule arbitrations because they are a little more formal and require uh, just some more logistical changes so, or, or considerations. So, uh, but, but they're both normally easier to, to schedule and the parties control the scheduling as opposed to the court controlling the schedule. In mediation, the parties reach an agreement or, or not with the help of a trained neutral mediator. And, and again, it's the parties that control their fate in a, in a mediation. The mediator does not tell them what to do, does not require them to settle, does not reach a decision, but simply serves as a facilitator and, and assists the parties in trying to reach resolution and to resolve their issues. In arbitration, it's different. The arbitrator is a decision maker and makes a mind, binding or non-binding decision according to the agreement. But normally they're a binding, they make a, the arbitrator makes a binding decision and the parties are basically bound by whatever that arbitrator decides. In mediation, that it's normally conducted very informally without sworn witnesses and testimony. Sometimes the parties will talk, sometimes they won't. Sometimes just the attorneys will talk. Sometimes they'll be in separate rooms and nobody will communicate with each other other than through the mediator. Uh, normally there's no testimony taken. So mediation is, is a very informal 
proceeding that doesn't require or involve a lot of evidentiary process. It, you know, parties basically have to rely upon the representations of the other as to what their witnesses and testimony and documents would show. And sometimes they'll exchange those in, in the furtherance of trying to reach agreement. In an arbitration, an arbitrator makes determinations of fact and law and liability and damages, and, and, and there is there that involves sworn witnesses and testimony and documents presented. A little less formal than the court system, but still there is a, a provision of evidence on both sides that will help the arbitrator make that decision. And often there is briefing that occurs and legal documents submitted that the arbitrator may even consider for a, a period of time after the actual hearing takes place. In a, in a mediation, there's generally no briefs filed, no legal documents filed. The mediator will often ask for the parties to each or the attorneys on each side to summarize the law and the facts and give the mediator a, a very concise um, kind of overview of each side's case. And the mediator will use that as just to help uh, help move the case along. But again, the mediator is usually not asking for legal briefs and, and very um, sophisticated legal writing that requires a lot of time or expense. Again, the mediator doesn't make a ruling, doesn't make a judgment. It's, it's up to the parties to do that. A mediation normally lasts a day. There, there are certainly ones that last longer, when, especially when you have multiple parties. But normally, uh, you can determine whether a case is going to settle or, or mediate uh, successfully or, or unsuccessfully or uh, within a day. Uh, sometimes a mediation will not settle in, in that day and the mediator and the parties will agree to leave the, the mediation open or to revisit some issues, maybe after a key deposition is taken or maybe after the parties go back and think about it for a few days or for whatever period of time. And so, uh, in a lot of cases, cases that go through mediation might not settle that day, but might settle a day later, might settle a week later, might settle a month later, either with the mediator involved or without the mediator involved. But generally, um, the actual parties meeting together with the mediator last about a day. There's sometimes half a day, again, sometimes more. An arbitration can go on uh, depending on the on the evidence and the witnesses and the number of exhibits and everything else can go on anywhere from a day to you know m multiple days and you know about the same period of time as a trial quicker than a trial normally you don't have to take quite as many breaks and sometimes the hours are longer and the, the parties control a lot of that so uh, so mediation's quicker um, and and certainly a lot a lot less formal. The cost for mediating a case generally ranges anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000, could be more, could be less, depending on the mediator's rates. Of course, you've got the attorney's fees involved, uh, for the attorneys involved that day, but uh, generally, because it's a one-day proceeding, you can cap that pretty quick. Cost for arbitration, probably pretty similar. Uh, you've got to pay arbitrators, and you have to pay anywhere from one to three arbitrators, depending on whether you have a one-person or three-person arbitration panel. And, uh, and attorneys, but uh, I would say arbitration would generally be a little more expensive. Uh, and again, if it goes on for several days, it would be much more expensive in that regard. In mediation, normally the parties split the cost unless agreed otherwise, and it's pretty typical in a mediation. Uh, toward the end, as the final negotiations are going on for one party or the other to ask that the other party pay the mediation fees for the mediator. And sometimes that's an agreement that's reached and sometimes it's not. But uh, normally the agreements or the court order will require splitting the cost between the parties. In arbitration, the arbitration agreement itself may require splitting cost or might require the losing party to pay, or there might be some provisions in the case that require the losing party to pay. Um, in mediation, if it's settled, the case is over. And there are very limited options for appeals of a mediation because it is an, a settlement agreement that's gr agreed to by the parties. So it's, it's pretty hard for them to argue that there was uh, a court error, as you would in most appeals. Uh, and so since the parties are voluntarily agreeing, there are very limited uh, what reasons for appeal. A few might be some, some issues of fraud or, or um, misrepresentation, or there could be a, a mistake in the, in the settlement agreement. 
but generally even those are not really taken through the appellate process, but the court might have to get re-involved or involved in it to help resolve issues or send the case back to mediation for clarification. In arbitration, there are limited appeal rights, but there are uh, some appeal rights when there is um, an abuse of, of judgment or uh, abuse of discretion by the arbitrator that uh, can be grounds for an appeal. And mediation, mediation is confidential by law in Alabama and, and many states and by agreement of the parties unless, unless the parties agree that something from there will not be confidential. Normally mediations are confidential from start to finish and everything that is said and every offer that's exchanged and everything that occurs during the mediation is confidential. Arbitration may be confidential. Uh, it again depends on the parameters of the of the agreement between the party and the particular arbitration rules that are being followed. But mediation is, is spends uh, the mediation provisions in the court orders and in the law require confidentiality as a critical component of mediation. Virtual mediation. Uh, this is becoming very, very, very popular, particularly with COVID-19. And, and uh, it's, at first I was a skeptic. I was thinking, you know, it really, it's, there's no substitute for parties sitting down in the same room and really focusing on a case to try to settle a case or resolve a case. But I have been very, very uh, pleasantly surprised as have most mediators that I've talked to that have con conducted or participated in virtual mediations. And uh, in fact, I have a, a friend in Florida who conducts hundreds of mediations a, a year. And uh, he tells me that his virtual mediations have been just as successful, if not even more than his live mediations. And so, um, so some of the pros, uh, they're effective. You can schedule them quickly. There's no logistics of moving parties around. Everybody kind of works from their office or their home. Very time efficient. I've found that they move quick. In fact, they move quicker than the live mediations uh, in many cases. Very cost efficient when you consider the loss or the, the uh, not having to deal with travel and logistics and renting facilities or using a, a mediator's facility or a law office. Um, you can accommodate multiple parties. If you might have space limitations at a law office or a mediator's office, but uh, with, with virtual mediation, you can have as many parties as the connective service like Zoom or uh, you know some of the others, WebEx and, and others will allow. And, and I know with Zoom, you, you, can, you can put a lot of different people in a lot of different uh, room, breakout rooms. You can certainly make accommodations for disabilities um, for people who might have access issues. One of the, uh, so that I, I put pro and con there because there may be some uh, considerations for people that, that, you know, have visual or hearing impairments and might, might not be as able to participate in a, in a virtual, but generally, uh, generally you can work through those if, if you have enough advance notice and, and are really determined to try to, to make this happen. I like that you, uh, when, you're, when you're in a virtual mediation, you really can focus on the speaker because the speaker is the one that pops up and you can, can study their, their um, facial uh, cues and, and uh, you know, and I just, I like being able to focus on the speaker and not, I guess I'm a little attention uh, uh, deprived sometimes where I'm looking all over the room and you're not able to focus on one person at a time and uh, in virtual mediation, you can do that. That's, I guess that can be a pro and a con. It's certainly more secure for the parties and the mediator. Um, I'm not talking about the technology security because that has been an issue from time to time. But, uh, most of the services uh, have worked through that with password protections and waiting rooms and, and the like. So there's much better protection now than there was in the early days of Zoom uh, presentations. But certainly they are uh, more secure for the, the parties from a physical security standpoint. And, and as we know, sometimes there are physical security issues that arise. And when everyone's in their separate place and on cameras and computers, you're certainly more secure than if you had everyone in the same room or the same building. Um, and, and I know family mediators uh, sometimes really appreciate that. Some of the cons, obviously, it, it's difficult to observe and ga gauge all the behaviors. You can only see what you can see, what's on the camera, and there may be things going on behind the camera or outside of the range of the camera that you can't gauge. But I haven't found that to be a real problem. 
privacy and confidentiality are a little more difficult to protect uh, because you don't know uh, you don't know who is in the room you don't know who's nearby who's listening in that you know that would outside you know in the office or wherever so you know, the parties have to work really hard to preserve confidentiality uh, I had an issue come up in a mediation not too long ago where we had agreed that you know the parties would be at their houses and everything else and a um, an extra person popped up in one of the uh, in one of the houses with one of the parties, and the party had invited her sister actually to participate with her, and um, nobody was really prepared for that, but she was there on the camera, and we were able to deal with it by just going offline and talking with the attorneys, and everyone agreed that that they were fine with it, uh, but you know if we would have been in an office and she would have shown up with her, we might have we would have never been in the same room together, the same group together, but uh, it didn't cause a problem. It, it's just something you have to be a little more attentive to. Some could have a little more difficulty engaging in a, in a virtual mediation just because of all the distractions, but generally I haven't had that to be, I found that to be a problem. I think if parties are spending the time and the money to, involve, to engage in, in mediation, they're pretty engaged and I haven't had an issue with losing the engagement, but I've had others tell me that you know, it can present some problems. Certainly technical issues with connections, uh, equipment, some people may not have, the, the inter good internet connections may not have the right equipment, may not have a camera on their computer. Uh, some people have issues moving people between breakout rooms. I haven't found that to be a problem, moving parties between breakout rooms on, on Zoom. I found Zoom to be a very good forum for mediations. And then accommodations for disabilities, again, that can be, that could work either pro or con. But generally we've been able to work through this. And one of the keys on the technical thing is get on early, work through your connective issues. I've even run trial runs with the parties and the attorneys uh, a day before, just to, in some cases, just to make sure everyone can connect. And then I always have a cell phone connection for everyone uh, we have cell phone numbers. We make sure we get those for everyone, including the parties or the attorneys at least have them so that if everything else breaks down, we can use cell phones to continue. And I have actually com done complete mediations using cell phones and found it to work. So um, the paradigm has shifted and, and, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the old way of doing things is not necessarily the only way and, or, or even the best way. And so uh, virtual mediation has been very popular. And as the court systems continue to be backed up even more with COVID-19, some of them are really backed up. Um, I think a lot of attorneys and a lot of parties are, are now finding that, hey, virtual mediation is, is a, a quick way to go. And it, it's really inexpensive and, and very effective. So the bottom line, I guess, in any forms of alternative dispute resolution, I found them to be faster, less expensive, in most cases, final and private. And, and parties and businesses uh, really appreciate that because uh, there are a lot of frustrations with the time and expense and the public nature of, of having to go through civil litigation. And mediation uh, is extremely successful, uh, anywhere from 50 to 85 percent of cases settle, depending on the state and the type of case. But the settlement rate in mediation is very, very good. Um, certainly, much less risk to the parties since they're the decision makers. Nobody's making a ruling but them, and so there's really, I always say, there's really nothing to lose by going through the process. Uh, and, and many times, it's it it serves to be a relatively inexpensive form of discovery and that you get to see what the other side is saying and what the other side, how they come across and how the parties come across. And, uh, and so, you know, that's not never the intent or it's usually not the intent to, to go through mediation just for the benefit of trying to learn, which usually most people do enter in with the attitude that they want to resolve the case. But, there is a lot of learning that occurs, even in cases that don't settle or don't resolve. Usually the parties will tell you, I know a lot more about the strengths and weaknesses of my case and the other side's case once the mediation's over. Uh, again, when it's over, it's over, very little, little room for appeal. And that's uh, very favorable to a lot of people because of the time and expense and the, and the uncertainty of the appellate uh, process. So, so when, how can you implement a mediation agreement for 
employees or for parties. Well, it's mediation is a contractual uh, agreement uh, unless it's ordered by the court or the parties just voluntarily agree. So um, I always tell and it, with a company that I worked with, uh, I worked with a large HR management company for many years, and we had an agreement with all our employees that said if they had a dispute with their employer, that first they had to go through mediation. And if mediation was unsuccessful, then they had to go through binding arbitration. And that was their, their only alternative. They waived the right to jury trial, uh, but they had all the same remedies through arbitration. They just didn't have the same uh, forum. They, did, they couldn't take it to court. They had to go through mediation and or arbitration. Um, and recently, uh, the general counsel of that company told me that they have decided to just go with mediation and to take out the arbitration part because they found that they were ending up in a lot of arbitrations that were tending to be expensive and they felt like they could have gotten some of those cases um, thrown out uh, by the court system on, on summary judgment. And so that was a little surprising to me, but um, that was her, her strong sentiment. But she said, we're gonna keep mediation in there because we have been successful in resolving most of our employment disputes with mediation. So uh, you, you certainly want to do it in an agreement with the employee, you know, not just in the policies or whatever. There needs to be a signed agreement that the employee agrees to take the issues through mediation. For existing employees, it, most attorneys would say it should be rolled out with some form of consideration so that you're not just saying, here, sign this, and, and there being no consideration. In an employment at will state, some take the position that continued employment is consideration, but out of an abundance of caution, I would say that if you're going to, uh, I, I would say talk to your attorney. <laughs> but but normally, a, a lot of more conservative attorneys would say, well, accompany it with uh, any change in benefits or a pay raise or some other value that you're giving to the employees. That that's the best time to roll out a new agreement. Um, and then you know, again, if you have an existing arbitration agreement in place, you might want to consider adding mediation as a first step. Uh, just knowing that it's quicker and sometimes less expensive and, and less risky for the, for the uh, parties to go through mediation before they get to the arbitration step. So uh, those are, I'm going to give some examples. Uh, I'm looking at the time here. It looks like we have about 10 minutes left. So I, I'm going to stop at this point and just uh, talk about or, or, or entertain questions because I have some examples of just, you know, how, taking a case through mediation might be better than going through trial, but uh, in the types of cases, some of the types of cases, uh, at least from the employment side um, that, that you see. But let's, let's take a minute and, and check to see if we have any questions, and certainly I encourage questions. So at this point, uh, Mike, we don't, I'm not seeing any questions come up, so uh, would you, maybe if you wouldn't mind um, sharing one of your examples and that might stimulate it, a question. Sure. Um, uh, you know, sexual harassment is, is certainly a, an area where mediation has proven to be very effective. And particularly because a lot of sexual harassment cases are very high profile. And so a lot of employers have found that if we can get a sexual harassment case to mediation, we can, we can deal with the facts confidentially. We can deal with any settlements confidentially. Um, and not have the potential for public exposure of the, you know, the facts of the case and, you know, embarrassment to the parties or whatever. Um, and, and in those cases, there's also a lot of psychological testimony that may come out. There's a lot of background testimony of the parties involved that is very, very personal and very, very sensitive. And so mediation is a great uh, forum or format. I believe for sexual harassment cases and have mediated several of those over the years and, um, and have found that to be much better than taking a, a sexual harassment case through the court system. I think we did have a question pop up, uh, uh, Eileen, unless that's something you put up. I just okay. said, uh, we're yeah. letting individuals know they have a okay. question to type it here. Okay, great, okay. So sexual harassment, again, is a, is a, is a, a type of case that, that works very well in the uh, in the in through mediation same way with uh, that age discrimination case that i started off this presentation talking about if we would have taken that case through um through mediation early on it's possible that the parties could have reached an agreement uh, that involved confidentiality provisions and everything else that could have 
resolve that case for a lot less than the defendant spent defending that case uh, and, and certainly quicker uh, than the six years it took and, and certainly uh, more private and, and uh, you know, with less time consumed for key players in the company. Um, and so that would also be an excellent case. Wage and hour cases are cases that are very attorney's fee uh, intensive and attorney's fee driven. I had a wage and hour case years ago that I defended where a, an employer had wage and hour liability and they ended up getting a, a lawsuit filed against them. And when they came to me, the case had already been filed down in South Florida. and We were in North Florida. The defendant was in North Florida. And the case, as we did some initial discovery, we determined that there was some liability. There was some unpaid overtime that needed to be paid. The liability in that case was about $750. And we attempted to settle the case for the $750, but there's attorney's fee provisions in the wage and hour laws that allow the plaintiffs to recover their attorney's fees. And by the time the case had been filed, the case had, you know, some initial discovery had occurred and all of that, the plaintiff's attorney contended that the attorney's fees were around $15,000 in the case. So this $750 case all of a sudden became a $15,750 case. And uh, we were able to settle it, but it was, you know, further down the line than if we would have mediated it earlier, we probably could have settled the case for a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, but it ended up settling for around $10,000 just because we would have had to go through court proceedings down in South Florida. And not only would they be paying the plaintiff's attorney, since they had some liability there, but they would be paying the defense attorney. And uh, of course, there, you know, we that was that I think that well, offer of judgment and offer of uh, you know settlement offers back in those times. Some of those provisions weren't quite as heavily used. And uh, but it's an example of a wage and hour case through discovery. You can burn some attorney's fees pretty quickly on both sides, and oftentimes they're you know very factually intense and very, a lot of legal issues. And so uh, mediation is a great place to resolve wage and hour cases. Now those do require court approval or Department of Labor approval. So there's a few more steps in those, but again, much more expedient and much more efficient normally than the uh, court system. Mike, we do have a question. Yeah. The question asks, in your experience, do you have a ballpark percentage of cases that use mediation by choice, not by contract prior to filing suit? Yeah, um, well, as I indicated, in some states like Florida, almost every case, oh, oh, wait a minute, okay, so you're asking about by contract prior to um, suit being filed. It, you know, it's a small percentage, I would say that. I think it's a growing percentage, but it's a very small percentage of, of businesses have mediation contracts. I would certainly encourage every business to look strongly at it, not only in their employment agreements, but also in their vendor agreements and in their service agreements and in their own services that they're providing is to put a mediation clause, maybe with an arbitration clause or without one, uh, in, in, as an alternative to going through the court system in the event of disputes. You see, you see a lot of arbitration agreements these days in, in commercial contracts, but uh, I would submit that putting a, a mediation clause in addition to that arbitration clause may end up being a, a much more expedient way to um, resolve a case and in and, and a, and a less risky way because again the parties make the decisions and not an arbitrator or a court but it's a very small percentage and I, but i don't have that number okay thank you um, the question goes on to say um, not by contract just because the parties to their attorneys are familiar with the potential cost savings of mediation. So they're choosing to go to mediation versus we're required to do it by contract. So making a choice yes. to participate in mediation. Absolutely. And more and more people as more and more parties and attorneys are becoming, you know, savvy about mediation and the advantages of mediation. More and more parties are, are taking things to taking disputes to mediation before litigation's even filed because everyone knows that once the case get filed, gets filed, it's out of your control. It becomes, it's, it's under the control of the court. And, uh, and, and that takes a life of its own. And so more and more parties are now considering that. I don't have statistics on that, but um, 
it's becoming more and more popular and I've had several submitted to me as, hey, we haven't had litigation yet, but in fact, uh, I was just in on one, uh, I co-mediated a, a Florida case last week or two weeks ago that was a hurricane damage case. And that, that was a pre-litigation case. And, you know, both parties decided this is the way to go. Let's go ahead and, because if it's in the court, the, the, the claimant may not get an answer or a judgment for, for years. Um, and the insurance company was motivated to keep their costs down. And so they were very eager to mediate. So a lot of these storm damage cases, and we'll probably see that more in Alabama now that, um, you know, we had the Hurricane Sally um, um, a few weeks ago. So um, you'll see more and more uh, hurricane damage cases, I think, in, in cases of that sort. But it, it, the good thing about mediation is it doesn't matter what the subject is. If there's a dispute, whether it's a property dispute or a personal injury or a contract dispute, almost anything is, is, is right for mediation because it's basically just uh, a facilitated negotiation just as you would with any business issue. There goes my alarm. So that means that we're close to being out of time. <laughs> so, I Alina, to you, I'm sure we've got about nine minutes left. Okay, great, great, excellent. Are there other questions? I'm happy to answer them. Well, I'm not seeing any come across I'll, yet. I'll go back now. Yeah. In the chat box. But I, I did have a, a question on your slide. You've got some examples about the coronavirus and the claims that might be associated with that. Could you elaborate more on that and how mediation can help? Yes, yes. Um, already, <laughs> good question. And I, I should have mentioned that earlier. Already, people are referring to this as the new uh, Lawyers uh, Support Act. Um, <laughs> there are so many disputes out there, potential disputes um, for people who are eligible for in emergency paid sick leave or emergency paid family leave under coronavirus, under the uh, Families First Coronavirus uh, Act, that um, uh, Response Act. So, so many people are eligible for it and employers are sometimes messing this up by not providing that leave properly. When they don't provide that leave properly, it becomes a wage and hour case, which means that it basically is, uh, the claimant is eligible to recover their attorney's fees. So I think that this is gonna be a wave of litigation that we're gonna see for quite a while where people are making claims and trying to recover their, their lost wages and, and their attorney's fees under the uh, uh, FFCRA. And so there's gonna be a lot of litigation in the future. And th this is again, if an employer uh, knows that, hey, I'm, I'm, I've got some exposure here, or if an employer is getting sued or having claims filed against them, I would really strongly encourage them to look at mediation as a possible way to resolve that case pretty quickly and efficiently without running up the attorney's fee tally on both sides. So I think we're going to see a lot of those down the road. That act is in effect and through the end of this year. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking that the statute of limitations on that is similar to uh, wage and hours, which would be two, two years and, and three years, but I may be wrong on that. I haven't researched the statute on that, but uh, we're going to see those cases and hear more about that as time goes on. And there are other issues coming out of coronavirus, such as private breach of privacy issues. We've already seen some cases uh, down in Florida where um, people have made claims against employers for uh, privacy violations uh, relating to coronavirus. And uh, I just there, the potential there is as imaginative as uh, attorneys are. So, uh, and as the court system allows. So, um, I think we're going to see a lot of cases there, and I think they're prime for. Uh, for mediation. Thank you, Mike. We do have another question that has uh, appeared in the chat box. Uh, the question is, what video conference, conferencing tools other than Zoom have you used for mediations? I use Zoom because I'm very comfortable with it and I know how to manipulate it well and I know how to put people in breakout rooms, but there are um, some law firms don't, don't allow Zoom. And so um, I know that they use WebEx, GoToMeeting, um, and other types of, and, and, and I'm not sure of all the other sub services out there because I'm, I'm sort of, once I've learned Zoom, I won't have to go learn something else. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> I finally figured it out and I know how to work the breakout rooms and all of that. And that's part of it. And, and you know, the, it, the, the good thing I found is that most parties are pretty patient um, during this as the mediator kind of sometimes fumbles through trying to get everybody to where they belong and 
that's why I say make sure you have cell phone numbers and everything else. But by and large, it's worked great. I don't know if anybody has experience with other formats that they think are, are very efficient or effective, but certainly if you do, you know, share it on the chat. And Mike, you're right. Um, I've heard of others using WebEx. Uh, and you had mentioned that. Yeah, a lot of law firms and large businesses use WebEx uh, anyway. And so it, 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 it fits in real well. And I know it has a lot of the same ability to share. Uh, Microsoft uh, has some products. Uh, almost every major software brand has, you know, has a, now has a, a virtual meeting uh, possibility just because that's how we're all doing it these days. So uh, it, it, it works. We're flexible and adaptable, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. And, and that's the great thing about mediation and ADR is it, it's flexible and adaptable. Even the court systems are becoming much more flexible and adaptable. But I think uh, the ADR is a little ahead of the court systems in that regard. All right. So we just have a few minutes left. And if you have any final questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. Otherwise, I'll give Mike uh, an opportunity for some closing remarks. Well, yeah, and I just uh, I thank you for the opportunity to participate, and I thank you all for participating today. And uh, I hope that this has been helpful. Again, I, it, I apologize if it was a little uh, more basic than than some people might uh, be looking for. But I, again, this is this is intended primarily for businesses and individuals that aren't as familiar with ADR, and, and I would encourage you. To to uh, utilize this or portions of this, if you think it's helpful to, uh, to share uh, with, with clients and others. Great. And I do see a raised hand. I do, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to get to our individual who's raised her hand. We need if you can put it. in the chat that might yes, be the easier way Wendy, yes if you don't mind sending a question in um the chat is, this is wendy can you hear me yes we can hear you now thank you okay Yay. good uh first of all thanks so much for the program i really um you know i learned a few things and much appreciated other than the course that cooper shattuck is uh preparing do you know any other courses to become a certified mediator in the state Sure, Wendy, I'll be happy to answer that. Um, at the Alabama Center for Dispute Resolution, there are two providers of mediation training that whose courses have been approved by the center to meet the registration standards. Um, Cooper Shattuck with Alabama Mediation Training, as well as Mediation CLE, um, offer general civil mediation courses, which is the, um, those include the 20 hour program. And then um, Mediation CLE, offers a 40 hour divorce and family mediation program. You can find out when those courses are being offered by visiting alabamaadr.org. And Perfect. under the if heading you know that says any of them are, Do you know if any of them are virtual? Because I know the one that Cooper was, was doing, it's, I think it's this week in Mobile, but it, it still involved like being in a hotel. Yes, so all the classes um, to meet the registration requirements are in-person classes. There are no virtual courses that have been approved by the center for the 20 or 40 hour program. Our registrations uh, requirements are that they be held in person in a classroom setting. Now the trainers that are offering these courses are practicing social distancing requirements and following CDC guidelines. And the courses began um, resuming back in June uh, with Alabama mediation training as well as mediation CLE began their courses again in August and their classes have been filling up and um, the feedback has been very positive. If you're in another state, if you're in another state, some states do allow uh, virtual Florida just adapted uh, some changes to its rules that allow that. I, um, I recently recertified in Florida and I had to go through some live instruction. Uh, actually, it was a 40 week program. I mean, 40 hour, not 40 week, 40 hour program. And uh, I was able to do that virtually and save thousands of dollars because I didn't have to get a hotel room or travel and I 
was able to do it you know, and everything else. So, uh, but um, you know, every state varies in their, their requirements to get on their registration or their certification uh, dockets or, or lists. And so you just need to check your states, but um, thanks for- I do our, hope Alabama changes that in that they do allow for virtual. I think it could be, you know, especially since the mediations are taking place virtually, you would think that the training could also be, but I understand it's a matter of changing the rules. Thank you so much again. Thank you for your comments. And thank you, yes, I appreciate your comments as well. Okay, Mike, I see that we're right at one o'clock. And uh, do, you, do you have any final remarks or comments you'd like to share? You've done a great job. We're mm -hmm. um, on behalf of the dispute resolution section of the Alabama State Bar, and of course, the Alabama Center for Dispute Resolution. Uh, we wanna thank you for taking time out of your schedule to share with us some insights about ADR and for businesses. Uh, we also like to thank everyone for joining us. I do want to remind everyone that this program was recorded. It will be made available through the Alabama State Bar's on-demand CLE program. Um, in the invitation link that you received uh, to log in today, there was a link to SurveyMonkey asking you to please complete a program evaluation. We welcome your feedback. Tell us what you liked, how we can improve, if there are any suggestions for future topics. Um, this is part of ABA Mediation Week events. Uh, ABA Mediation Week is occurring um, and the governor of the state of Alabama has proclaimed October 19th through the 23rd as Mediation Week, so we're very grateful for that. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. And with that, we'll go ahead and end our program. Thanks again, Mike. Thank you.